live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. What is the biggest key to a successful college football program? Well, depending on who you ask, you're going to receive a ton of different answers. Some would say that the number one thing is having support from the top, as in having an athletic director and a university president that values you and gives you all the resources you need to succeed. Some would say in today's day and age that it depends on how strong your boosters are. Some would say that it's about having a great coaching staff that can get the most out of its players and can design great game plans. And while all of these are good answers, perhaps the number one thing that people would say above all else is that to be a successful college football team, you need to be good at recruiting. You need to make an effort to get the best kids in the state and the country to come play for your school. You need to be hitting the recruiting trail, going to high schools, and putting in the work to get prospective student athletes to choose your school over everyone else's. And that means fostering a great relationship with the high schools in question, especially locally, where you're more likely to have an edge over other schools due to the familiarity that the student athlete feels with the area and due to the close connections that they may have with their family. In other words, if you do something that ticks off, quite literally, every single high school in the state, to the point where those high schools ban you from stepping foot on their campus and attending their games and talking to their players, then oh man, you're going to be in for a rough time. Imagine if Florida did something so wrong in the eyes of the Florida High School Athletic Association that every Florida high school banned them from recruiting their players. Imagine if Texas couldn't step foot on the campus of any high school in the state because the association thought that the Longhorns were destroying the fabric of Texas high school football. Well, in 2002, that's exactly what happened to the team that you've been watching this whole time, the East Carolina Pirates. Because in 2002, after they scheduled a game against the University of Cincinnati in Conference USA, a massive firestorm was created, causing a giant controversy and causing high schools across the state to advise their players not to go to East Carolina under any circumstances. Because this is the story behind the bizarre controversy between East Carolina, ESPN, and the North Carolina High School Athletic Association. Before I talk about the controversy in question and why there was so much outrage over it, we need some context to understand why East Carolina made the decision that they did knowing that there was going to be furor over this move. The year is 2002, and East Carolina is having an uncharacteristically bad year. After making three straight bowl games under head coach Steve Logan, and finishing with a winning record in each of the past four seasons, things are not looking so good for the Pirates this year. Through the first 11 games of the season, East Carolina sat at 4-7, in serious danger of posting their worst record since 1993. You can blame an atrocious defense for that, as the Pirates allowed more than 33.2 points per game, ranking 97th in Division 1A out of 117 teams, and having one three-game stretch in the middle of the season against South Florida, Louisville, and Houston, where they allowed at least 44 points in every single game. Every opponent scored at least 20 points on the Pirates, and they could not do anything in the turnover department, with not a single player on the team having more than two interceptions. Combined with some awful quarterback play from Paul Troff, who finished the season completing just 49% of his passes while throwing 15 touchdowns and 20 interceptions, finishing with an awful touchdown-to-interception ratio of 3-4, to four, and finishing with the fourth-most interceptions in all of Division 1A, and it's no surprise to see why East Carolina was struggling heavily in 2002. With just one game to go in the season, they already had no chance at making it to a bowl game as nothing that they could have done could have made them bowl eligible. Having said that, this final game of the season was still an absolutely massive one, because this final game of the season would be at home against Cincinnati in front of a national television audience on ESPN. Now for East Carolina, they hadn't been on ESPN all season, so they took a massive hit in television revenue, especially when compared to 2001. Whereas ECU made over $757,000 in TV revenue in 2001, thanks to each of their final five games appearing on the ESPN family and networks, 
including their iconic GMAC Bowl game against Marshall, where they lost 64-61 in double overtime, their revenue in 2002 was roughly half of that, at just $380,000. Unlike the 2001 season, unless you were regionally based, you weren't seeing East Carolina on your TV screens. It just wasn't happening. Combine the loss of TV revenue year to year with the rising costs in scholarships year to year, as scholarship costs were up roughly $437,000 in 2002 compared to 2001, and you can see why East Carolina found themselves in a bit of a pickle. However, by playing this game on ESPN, they were going to get an additional $160,000 in TV revenue, alleviating some of the pain at least. There was just one problem with this nationally televised game against Cincinnati. As part of the eight-year, $80 million deal that Conference USA signed with ESPN, these games were being played on weeknights in order to maximize exposure and ratings. And this meant that this game, which was originally scheduled for Saturday, November 2nd, was being moved to the end of the season on Friday, December 6th. And I'm sure you might be able to see where this one is going. Because Friday night is predominantly known for one kind of football only, and that's this kind of football that you're watching right now. High school football. And not just any old high school football, but rather the playoffs for the North Carolina High School Athletic Association, and more specifically, state semifinal games. What you're watching right now are some highlights from the 2002 season in North Carolina high school football. As in, exactly what East Carolina was going up against by playing this Friday night game at home and encroaching on their territory. Now, to be fair to the Pirates, head coach Steve Logan did not want anything to do with this, saying that he regretted this scheduling conflict, and saying, our players have nothing to do with it, and neither do I. All those things are issues for people who have a lot of influence and power that I don't have. However, that's not to say that the administration didn't want this. Because in the administration's eyes, so what if it interferes with the state semifinals? We need the money. We need the exposure. We wholeheartedly accept ESPN's invitation to move our game to a Friday night, especially since the previous year in 2001, East Carolina worked around the high schools in their complaints that one of their Friday games was being played on the night of Black Friday, so they moved it up to an 11 a.m. start time. This time, we're not accommodating you. There's too much at stake on our end. As Mike Hamrick, the athletic director for East Carolina, said on all of this, in making this change, we are helping Conference USA meet its obligations with ESPN. I previously indicated to Conference USA that East Carolina will not play on Friday nights due to possible conflicts with area high school football schedules, and we will continue that stance. However, we have been asked to reconsider our position in this case due to special circumstances, which indicate we have no choice but to play on a Friday night. We feel that this particular date will have a very minimal, if any, impact on high school football. Wait a second. A minimal impact on high school football? The day of the state semifinals? As in, one of the biggest and most looked forward to high school football days of the entire year, with upwards of 16 games being played? That's the day you say it's going to have a minimal impact? That's like me planning a remote getaway in a cabin in the woods with no Wi-Fi, and asking my college basketball loving friends to come, saying that the getaway will have a minimal impact on their sport, even though the getaway is planned for the first Thursday of March Madness. Safe to say, you can imagine how furious the NCHSAA was about this, seeing as this game, all in the name of money, was going to interfere with high school attendance. Said Dick Knox, the deputy director for the NCHSAA, it's dollars and cents. Mostly dollars, and not much cents. I think that this could definitely have ramifications on our playoff attendance. And even though East Carolina tried to spin this, with Hambrick saying that he was all for saving Friday night for high school football, and that the last thing he ever wanted to do was hurt high school football, a bunch of people did not see it that way. Not in the slightest bit. Danny Kinlaw, a member of the ECU Board of Trustees, was ashamed of this decision by his school, saying, You don't go around kicking people in the face. High schools are our support, our feeder system. This is not East Carolina. 
This is my Camrick Steel. And Harold Robinson, the coach at Williamston, one of the high schools in the state, said on this, as a graduate of East Carolina, I'm embarrassed with the whole situation. In fact, Robinson was so embarrassed that he, along with a bunch of other coaches at other schools, decided to ban East Carolina from even attending their games. Williamston, Southern Durham, and High Point Central were just some of the many high schools who protested this decision by flat out saying that ECU was no longer welcome. You want recruiters to come visit this school? Too bad. We're not going to help you out after you refuse to help us out. You're going to destroy high school football and go back on your word all for a few extra dollars? And now, you have the audacity to try and get our high schoolers, the same ones that you're hurting, to come play for you and to come give you money? Fat chance. To say that East Carolina had the entire state up in arms would be an understatement, because not a single high school was on the side of the Pirates. When you have high schools outright banning you from conducting recruiting trips, that's when you know you messed up pretty badly. But the anger of the high schools wasn't just directed at East Carolina. It was also rightfully directed at ESPN, since that was the only reason that the game was even rescheduled for this Friday in the first place. ESPN even asked for permission during the ECU Cincinnati game to show portions of one of the semifinal games, which was a battle in the 4 AA semifinal between Charlotte Butler and Charlotte Independence. And when ESPN asked permission to do this, the NCHSAA just laughed in their faces and unanimously rejected the request. Said Charlie Adams, the executive director for the NCHSAA, their representative told us that they wanted to promote our playoffs by showing some of the game. If ESPN wanted to help high school athletics, it wouldn't be televising a college football game on Friday night. And when you put it like that, yeah, that's a really good point. ESPN wants to have their cake and eat it too. And it doesn't work like that, especially when the tensions and the stakes are this high. Which raises the ultimate question. How did this situation play out? Well, for East Carolina, there is both good and bad news. The bad news was that the Pirates lost yet again, as Cincinnati decimated East Carolina's poorest defense, winning at 42-28 thanks to starting quarterback Gino Gadouli throwing four touchdown passes, three of which went to John Olinger and thanks to running back DeMarco McCluskey picking up 161 rushing yards on just under 5.5 yards per carry. However, the good news? As it turns out, there was never any conflict. Due to a winter storm that hit North Carolina that week, none of the games were played that Friday, and instead, the 16 semifinal games were dispersed between Saturday and Monday. In other words, there was such an uproar over ECU interfering with high school football, but because of the weather, it never interfered at all. As Williamson head coach Harold Robinson said on this, maybe the football gods have smiled on East Carolina, maybe we can put this behind us and move on. So crisis averted, question mark? Even though the end result worked out by pure chance, how we got to that point was nothing short of chaotic and rage-worthy. The 2002 season was a rough one for ECU. I think that goes without saying. They had one of their worst seasons in a decade, in a season so bad that head coach Steve Logan, who had been there for 11 seasons at that point, resigned. Their 4-8 record meant that they finished the season with the third fewest wins of any team in Conference USA. Their defense was nauseatingly bad, and any national exposure that they had around the turn of the millennium was all but gone by this point. But perhaps the biggest loss that ECU took, more than any other, was with every high school in the state. Because as a general rule of thumb, money isn't everything. And sometimes, a few thousand dollars isn't worth ticking off your recruiting base and just about everyone relevant in the state in which you play in. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated.
So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.